Today, we're going to talk about this. This is the coffee jack. This is a handheld manual espresso maker. You put ground coffee in, hot water in, you press it with your hands, and espresso comes out. And it is perhaps the quintessential coffee Kickstarter cautionary tale, a phrase that I did have to practice before saying it out loud. And today, I want to talk about both it as a review. Does it work? Is it good? Does it make tasty coffee? But also use this as an opportunity to talk about Kickstarters in general, specifically coffee ones, but also kind of just the whole world of crowdfunding and backing projects uh, and how we might learn from this particular device how to think about them in the future. I should give you a little bit of backstory if you're not familiar with this. So this has been something of a controversial Kickstarter because it has been incredibly late. Going all the way back, this launched back in October 2019. And back then, they were proposing to deliver round about May the following year, so May 2020. Some of you will probably see where this is going, knowing what happened in the year of 2020. But they finally delivered this to me in February 2023, which is really, really late. And people accuse them of all sorts of things. People accuse them of being scammers. Uh, they just got a lot of flack from all sides. And let me be clear, in this video, I am not out to vilify or demonize the people that created this product. I'm sure they have had a very stressful few years finally bringing this thing to market through all the challenges and delays they had. Uh, and so, to be honest, I probably have more uh, sympathy than I do anger, but that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. So going all the way back, it's 2019. I see this. Loads of people send it to me. It's a really successful Kickstarter. It's kind of everywhere. So I'm like, fine, it's £69. I will back it. I'll have a go. I'll see what happens. Not really sure what they were going to make. It seemed ambitious to create that much pressure in this small of a, a space with this kind of a mechanism. And then in 2020, the world happened to everyone. Uh, people who were trying to manufacture products in China had a really difficult time, and this got pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And then when they did start to get into manufacturing, they had loads of issues. And so I think by August 2021, they'd issued like a big long update on Kickstarter, kind of covering everything that had gone wrong up to that point, aiming for delivery towards the end of that year. For context, the Pico Presso by Wakako was launched in, I think, June 2021. So that was out on the market ahead of this thing. This would have been first, uh, but that beat it to the punch by quite a long way. By May 2022, they'd issued another update being like, it's okay, it's manufacturing, it's shipping, it's shipping, it's manufacturing, uh, and it didn't ship. And I, I think this constant stream of updates was very confusing for people who had backed this project. Some people felt they were being strung along by scammers. Uh, others were kind of reassured, and others who probably knew something about the process of getting stuff made, were like, they're having a terrible time. Uh, and, you know, luck is against them. Their designs are problematic, it seems, and they've got lots of stuff to fix. But that's the nature of building stuff. So they finally delivered it to me. And this is what arrived. This is my £69 worth of coffee maker. Notable, I think, to say at this point that if you buy one of these new today, it's £150, which is, which is a lot more. So... I got a pretty big discount for my Kickstarter sort of contribution. If this was the only thing that had arrived, maybe this review would go in a different kind of way. They did also send a few extras through. Uh, I think I bought a stand along the way, uh, and then they sent me a bunch of stuff for no real reason. But it, it does change the pricing for this thing. You know, I'll talk about this as a, is it £69? Is that good value for money? But that's a, a question that's only really relevant to people who paid that money back then and got the Kickstarter unit. Later, when we talk about should you buy one of these today, it's a very, very different financial equation. I guess now we'll take it to pieces and, and show you kind of how it works. It's a pretty clever design. I will say that. There's some really nice thoughts in this. It is well made. I can't help but compare it to the Wakako Pico Presso. Now, we did test that product in a strange day out in London, where we took a bunch of portable espresso makers and made espresso in a bunch of strange places. The Pico Presso in the middle of the Thames. If you haven't seen it, it's up here if you want to watch that. I, I do recommend it. It was a good day out. This thing uh, breaks apart into kind of two main pieces. The bottom here is your basket. That's where you're going to load and tamp your ground coffee. They do come as standard with a kind of little uh, pressure valve here to act like a pressurized portafilter to give you crema with coarsely ground coffee. You can take it out pretty easily. I took mine out. I don't want to do that. I've got good grinders. That's not a problem for me. Then you've got the sort of main piece of it. This bit pops out and it's your pumping mechanism. So this is how we're going to generate pressure. And you put your hot water in the tank, you lock your coffee into place, and you pump 
and, and espresso happens. There's some details on their website. I'll show you their kind of design. But one of the little tweaks in here is there's actually an overpressure valve so that if you create more than nine bars of pressure inside this little space, it will actually bleed that pressure back out into the water tank above you, which is a, an interesting piece of design. It lets you know roughly when you're getting to nine bars or above it, or, you know, you can't really go above it, but when you're at that kind of point, I would not recommend brewing at very high pressures with this thing. I didn't have the best results that way, but let's, uh, let's make some coffee with it. Now I did say I had a stand. This is the stand. This unit does sit very neatly on top of it. You kind of need it if you're going to make espresso. I don't have an espresso cup that this bit would sit on sort of safely. You know, you'd be pressing onto a cup. I don't really think it's something I want to be holding in the air because this is an open container of near boiling water. So I don't know. I don't feel like I want to be kind of splashing that around over my hands. So I do want it down on something, but I want it on something robust and significant. The stand is, I think, 45 pounds. Uh, so it's a little bit expensive, but I would say if you're making espresso with this, pretty much essential. If you're just making an espresso-like thing at the bottom of a mug to put some hot milk in to make a cappuccino or a latte, sure, I could see how you could get around that if you're not obsessing over the espresso. But if you do want to drink straight espresso and have a good time, I think you need the stand. So factor that into the cost right now. Now I am going to have to preheat this unit quite significantly. If you put boiling water in here and I stuck a probe in it and had a look, the boiling water without preheat will drop to low 80s, like 81, 82 degrees Celsius, pretty much instantly. And it'll hold there for a, a, about a minute or so before beginning to decline more often. That is too cool for most of the espresso that I would want to drink. Interestingly, if I dump that water out once it's stabilized in temperature and put boiling water in, it held at around 91 degrees Celsius. And if I dumped that water out and put fresh boiling water in again, it was still at around 91 to 92 degrees Celsius. So a preheat is essential, but double preheating is not. But you want to preheat uh, until right before you brew, dump that water out, fresh boiling water in, and then go to get the best temperatures if you're, if you're brewing lighter roasted coffees. Now, from a user perspective, getting coffee into this little basket is a little bit tricky. They don't give you a dosing funnel or anything like that with it. It just comes like this and, and it's sort of up to you to get the coffee in. I happen to have a dosing ring that just about fits. So I'm going to use that, which is cheating, but I don't want to make a mess. Give it a little needle distribution. Dose wise, I think with lighter roasted coffees, you wouldn't want to be above 15 grams. This is about 14 and a half grams in here today. I say about 14 and a half as if that's not incredibly precise to most people, but still, you know what I'm talking about. I would recommend distribution with this thing. Uh, we'll talk more about the dynamics of its brewing and its evenness in a second after we've made this coffee and what we might do to improve it. And I'll give you kind of my best shot routine that is a little different to maybe how they would recommend you use it. Now, this is the tamper that is extra. It's about 30 pounds, I think. It's quite nicely made. It's branded and everything, a little etching on the bottom. It annoys me that this is not standard. Without this, you have no way to tamp it. I think it looks like they almost lock it in to tamp it in one of their videos. I would not recommend that at all. I think this does need to be tamped. And so again, this I think is close to essential or a suitably fitting tamper because frankly, as this is custom made, it annoys me there's a little bit of play here. That shouldn't be there. I don't want a little bit of play. I want a perfect fit. This is designed by you for your product. Just the tolerances should be should be right. Sorry to complain about these things, but it's just nicer when they fit nicely. I'm not going to load that in straight away because we need to preheat it and then dump some water through it. And I'll explain kind of a bit more about how the pumping mechanism works. So this is my preheat water. It is annoying to have to boil a kettle and then potentially boil a kettle again to do this. The way this works is interesting. What I'm going to do, I could just turn this upside down and dunk the water out, but I actually will push it through because it's instructive. As you push down, nothing seems to happen, right? And that's the kind of pressing out moment. When you pull up, that's when water is drawn into the chamber. So you need to make sure that you allow the, the piston to come all the way up before you press again. And then you can see that when I come up, the, le the level drops and I push that water that I pulled in out. In doing that, I, I pumped that through till it was empty. And what you might've noticed when I first pressed is that nothing came out because that chamber is empty. So what I'm gonna do actually is put fresh water in, nice hot water into a preheated unit. And this is, this is now hot to touch. Another reason I don't really want it off the stand. I'll pump a couple of times just to make sure that chamber is consistently filled. Then I'm gonna lock my coffee in. I'm gonna brew some espresso. And then I've got a minute while this tears to start uh, pre-infusion. So I'm gonna give it maybe three or four pumps, which will take me to 
12 to 16 mils of water going into the coffee. It's pretty consistent that when you pump, if you've allowed to draw it properly, it'll give you four mils of water. I would recommend a relatively long pre-infusion on this uh, if you're using finer grinds and trying to get higher extractions. And then we're gonna, we're gonna go. And you'll start to feel resistance build and you get a nice steady flow of espresso. I'll generally aim for about a three to one ratio. That seems to work best for me. It's not bad. It tastes a little bit like it's channeled. What you want in an espresso is all of the water to pass evenly through all of the coffee. If you get a sort of channel where some water can pass more quickly through the coffee, that water doesn't pick up much flavor, adds quite a lot of sourness and also bitterness because it will over extract that coffee because more water will pass through a smaller amount of coffee around that channel. And that's what that tastes like to me. It doesn't taste incredibly even, that was well distributed, that was well tamped. Uh, and I think there's a couple of flaws in the design that cause that to happen. But I think there are some things you can do to mitigate that. Let me show you what I mean. You can see in the puck itself, a kind of divot in the middle, a kind of soft spot of divot here where it feels like the pressure has kind of dug a hole in the middle of the puck. And I don't think that does uh, good things for flavor when that happens. And it seems like as the pressurized water is pushed through the shower screen, it's more concentrated at the middle and it's kind of digging a hole in the coffee that way. I also think that the basket itself the design isn't great. I don't think the holes are problematic, but there is quite a large area where there aren't that many holes. Let me clean this out and I'll show you. If you look in this now empty basket, you'll see that there's a little sort of a logo stamped right in the middle in an area right in the center of the basket where there are now no holes because there's this logo kind of stamped in the middle. And I don't think that's ideal, especially when you've got a kind of tunnel of pressure coming from above. I don't really know what it's doing to the flow, but it, it for me, has not been ideal as an extractor of coffee. That's, like I said, it's not, it's not bad. What you can do to mitigate that though is what's called a paper sandwich. Now, before I set that up, what I will say is cleaning this is relatively easy. It knocks out pretty easily, but often I would use something like a little towel to wipe the inside of a, a basket out. In this case, uh, it really seems to collect coffee around the edges of the rim. It's kind of hard to see, but you go in there with your finger after you wipe it out and you'll find some. So this really needs a rinse after every use uh, in order to get rid of everything here and then a dry wipe to make sure it's nice and dry and clean again when you're done with that before you prep the next puck. So these are the papers we're gonna use for our, our little filter paper sandwich. These are designed to be used at the bottom of espresso baskets. If you want a video about how I make espresso and all that stuff, that's also up here, you can watch it if you wanna know more about that. Anyway, we're gonna awkwardly press one to the bottom of this thing here. And by placing it over the basket, we prevent issues with clogging of the holes and we sort of ease flow through the coffee bed in a way that the basket itself sometimes restricts. So that will help with evenness quite a lot. Then coffee on top, a little distribution, and then a paper on top. Now the, the paper on top is going to essentially protect the coffee from aggressive water. It will prevent that kind of channeling happening a little bit. It is a little awkward and we've added a little bit of cost to our espresso because those papers are not free and they cost money and we've added time and complexity, but we should get a, a more even flow, a better flow from the finer grind. It'll flow a little quicker, which is good uh, and should taste much, much better. What you get, I mean, it looks pretty good. Not true espresso, if you know what to look for, but much closer. And that's a kind of Lungo style thing. It's a three to one ratio. It's about three times more liquid than the coffee I started with. I would say for lighter roasts, this is essential as a, as a ratio. I think with darker roasts, you could go shorter and have more of a ristretto style thing. But for a good extraction, I haven't had much success at, at under three to one ratios. It's a much better shot. Texture is very nice. It's still got some nice body. It's got some sweetness. It's got some sort of heft to it a little bit more. It's pretty light roast. You know, it's not in the sort of medium to dark end of espresso. It's at the lighter end of espresso, but that's that's a better extracted shot. I wouldn't be unhappy with that if I was served it in a cafe. You can taste the temperatures a little bit low and I wish there was a way for this to brew a little bit hotter. I think that would sweeten things up a little bit. Give me two, three more degrees at the start. That would really help, but it's not bad. Let me clean up so we can talk about this and also Kickstarter again in a bit more depth. So that I think is a fair summation of my time pulling shots with the coffee jack. And it's been interesting and it's been kind of fun to use. 
I hope that they make another one. I hope that they evolve this product into something else. Uh, and that's because they now know what it is to deliver a project of this level of complexity. Because if there's one takeaway from this video, outside of the coffee jack, that, that I want you to sort of have, it's that when you assess a Kickstarter, that's the question. Has this company ever delivered a project of this complexity before? If you looked at Coffee Jack, they did have a track record of delivering on their Kickstarters, but none of those previous projects had anything like the level of complexity of this. We've talked many times on this channel about just how hard hardware manufacture is, especially at the beginning, the first time you do it. This is not an isolated phenomenon to coffee or to Coffee Jack. Even Fellow, a company with a track record of delivering relatively complex products, did struggle when they did their first grinder, the Ode. It wasn't flawlessly delivered, and that's understandable. Getting this stuff right is really hard, because until you've done it, you don't know what you don't know. You go into it full of optimism, full of hope, you, you know what the challenges probably are, but there's a bunch of stuff that you don't yet know about. But if they did it again, I guarantee it would flow so much more smoothly, so much more quickly, and I don't think they'd have the same level of issues. And so, it's tricky. The, the, the kind of nature of Kickstarter is, here's a massive discount because we don't know what's going to happen and how it's going to go. That's not the nicest way of putting it, but I got something that's worth £150 for £69. I had to wait three years for it, but I got it and it works and I can tweak it and make it do what I want to. And that's not a bad deal. At £69, this I think is great value for money. At £150, plus 30 for the tamper, plus 45, 50 for the stand. Well, then you're up against things like the Flare Pro, which I think is a more capable, if less portable, espresso maker. But I understand why it costs what it costs. This, compared to something like the Pico Presso, feels way more premium. It's solid, it's sturdy, it feels built to last. The Pico Presso feels plasticky, and that's occasionally useful. It probably has better thermal retention than this thing does, but uh, it doesn't feel quite as nice. And it depends what matters to you. But now, I really, really want to hear from you. Have you got one of these? Did you get one? Are you a Kickstarter backer? Tell us of your experience. I'm sure you went through some frustration. I think that's a given. Now that you've got it, are you getting on with it? Are you brewing often? Did you end up getting something else while you were waiting? I will say I've actually used a couple of these units and one, this one here in my hands, has been a little bit more consistent and has made better tasting coffee than the other one. I don't know if that's common that some people have had issues and some uh, haven't. Uh, maybe I just got very unlucky with one of the units that I got, but this one works well. Does yours. Let us know your experiences down in the comments below. But for now, I'll say thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a great day.